disaster, natural or man-made, may result in multiple human casualties that require organized efforts to maintain order to preserve life. Disaster is any occurrence that threatens or causes loss of life and property and exceeds the routine capabilities of local governmental, health care, and community agencies. About once a year in the United States, disasters involving more than 100 deaths occur, and any area is a possible disaster site. In nearly all disasters, substantial resources are available. Often they exceed the need. Planned organization is necessary so that management of the disaster proceeds in an orderly manner to preserve life and property. Very few injuries must be treated immediately. With planned organization, the triage concept, classifying and prioritizing casualties so that the most severely injured will receive attention first, can and must permeate the entire response. A natural disaster, such as a flood, can have a wide-ranging impact upon a community, a region, or indeed an entire nation because of injuries or death, property damage, disruption of communications, business and everyday life, and serious hampering of local emergency services. Man-made disasters, fires, explosions, transportation accidents, hazardous material incidents, and civil disturbances are more localized occur much more frequently and account for 80 percent of disaster fatalities. For some types of man-made disasters such as toxic chemical spills or radiation and nuclear accidents planning must include specific provisions. But the principles of planning for the orderly pre-hospital management of mass casualties are basically the same for any disaster. We'll illustrate these principles in action in a simulated air disaster. A chartered jet carrying some 130 passengers is starting its approach to Philadelphia International Airport. Coincidentally, a private plane, which had taken off from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, is en route to Millville, New Jersey. The jet continues its descent into Philadelphia Airport, and at approximately 6,000 feet, the planes collide over the Delaware River. Both planes crash in Fort Mott State Park on the New Jersey shore of the river. The private plane with its three passengers comes to rest in the park. Some victims are dead, but others are alive with injuries of various degrees of severity. Most have only minor injuries and probably will survive no matter what is done or is not done. But for the seriously injured, survival may well depend on First, adequate first response of needed manpower and equipment. Second, establishment of a command post for good authoritative site control. Third, establishing good communications among diverse rescue agencies. Fourth, triage throughout of victims in the field, at the transportation assembly area and at the hospital. Fifth, coordinated transportation of the injured to all area hospitals. And sixth, disaster plans at the receiving hospitals to manage casualties. All these elements are essential to the planned orderly management of a disaster. Let's look at each to see the problems involved and how planning can help overcome them. 
Adequate first response of needed manpower and equipment depends upon pre-planned coordination of police, fire, and other rescue agencies, often from various governmental jurisdictions. First notification of a disaster usually is received by the fire or police department. An established, well-publicized 911 emergency number is an effective system for first notification. Even with a 911 system, a panicked witness may call the local police, the county sheriff, the state police, a hospital, even a newspaper or broadcasting station. The witness may greatly exaggerate, or less frequently understate, the magnitude of the event. The agency receiving the first notification must inform the appropriate first responding agencies, fire and police, with an initial assessment, however crude, of the nature and magnitude of the disaster. So the responding agencies can dispatch at once the manpower and equipment they believe will be necessary to manage the disaster. The responding agencies immediately should alert their counterparts in other jurisdictions as to the possible need for additional manpower and equipment. At the site, the senior agency official should have a quick assessment of needs made so he can call for assistance if needed. In some areas, a special call system is in operation which simplifies the requesting of additional aid. Officer, we've got a major air disaster here. How about setting up roadblocks? We have a lot of inbound equipment coming in. Okay. Would you have your men block the road coming in and we'll keep in touch as to which vehicle should come in, which shouldn't? This fire official has already begun to establish a command post, authoritative control at the site, another important element of effective disaster management. The command post and its officials should be clearly identifiable day or night. The command post is an ad hoc super agency, a new structure to coordinate and prevent confusion among the multiple rescue agencies that ordinarily have little communication with each other. Ideally, an area or regional disaster plan would designate the site commander. In the absence of such a plan, the senior fire or police official first on the scene should assume this responsibility to be superseded by the arrival of a more senior official. One of the first jobs of the site commander is to designate on-site senior trained persons from appropriate agencies to assume the six basic responsibilities of the command post. To coordinate rescue agencies, to keep the site open, to establish communications, to coordinate transportation, to coordinate press relations, and to coordinate with state and federal agencies. A disaster, especially when it occurs in a suburban or unincorporated area, often is responded to by a number of rescue agencies, several fire jurisdictions, private ambulances, National Guard rescue teams, Red Cross, and here, even the Coast Guard. They often will begin arriving at the site before control has been firmly established. Volunteers also will show up and offer to help. The command post must coordinate their efforts, making certain they are all operating according to the same plan to achieve the common goals, the preservation of life and property. Assigning a volunteer coordinator will help control and direct the efforts of those who show up and offer to help. Requests for assistance, either personnel or equipment, must be channeled through the command post. Necessary rescue vehicles must have clear access to and from the disaster site. This involves keeping spectators and other unneeded persons away, controlling volunteers, and preventing improperly parked police, fire, ambulance, press, or other vehicles from blocking access to the site. Communications, too, can suffer roadblocks, since police, ambulances, and hospitals often use different frequencies for radio communications. The command post must coordinate communications equipment and personnel and maintain open communications with all involved agencies. The command post also must coordinate the transportation of the injured. Without coordination, overburdening of the nearest hospital can result, and specialized treatment facilities may be overlooked, especially when several agencies and modes of transportation are available. 
Often, the news media are among the early arrivals at the disaster site. Assuring that the media receive the most accurate information possible will help prevent exaggerated reports of the situation. The command post should assume responsibility for releases and statements to the print and electronic media, as well as for controlling access of the press to the disaster site to minimize interference with rescue operations. The site commander may choose to designate a press officer and delegate these responsibilities to him. If coordination with state and federal agencies is required, the command post must see that this is accomplished. 51 to Salem County Hospital. Communications are among the most important problems of disaster management. Okay, we'll be back with you. Communications problems often begin with first notification of the disaster. Even if a 911 emergency call system is in operation, the very first call may be to any of several police or fire jurisdictions. It may be inaccurate or exaggerated. And after initial notification, each notified agency tends to call whomever it is accustomed to calling. Do you read me? In addition, communications in many disasters are complicated by the fact that some of the agencies involved can't communicate with each other because their radios often are on different frequencies and telephones may be unavailable or overburdened. We're not able to get the state police on our frequency. We'll have to get them over the phone, all right? All right. We have a problem. I can't talk with the fire department on our frequency. Can you patch us through with a landline? In many communities, emergency operating centers, or EOCs, are established and can serve as communications coordinators in disaster management. The EOCs seldom are full-time operations, but they can be made operational within a short period of time. However, an ad hoc communication center may have to be established at the disaster site. The site commander will need to appoint a communications officer who can rapidly commandeer and establish communications that will enable the command post to communicate quickly with all the agencies involved. Perhaps the most efficient way of establishing an on-site communication center is to adopt the circle of wagons technique of the pioneers. Vehicles with communications equipment from each of the various agencies involved are arranged in a circle around the command post. Each agency uses its own radio frequency, but reports to the command post for instructions. Thus, the command post has readily accessible two-way communications with all involved agencies, as well as with personnel who are knowledgeable of their agency's capabilities and resources, plus radio language usage. Once established, this ad hoc communication center can serve throughout the on-site management of the disaster or until an emergency operating center is functioning. The site commander designates a person with some medical training, this may be a paramedic or EMT, to direct the medical rescue operations. This responsibility may be transferred upon the arrival of a more senior medical person or physician. He'll deploy rescue personnel, may designate a triage officer, coordinate reports of casualties and medical supply needs, and receive reports of hospital capabilities. The medical coordinator should foster the concept of triage that should permeate the entire rescue operation from initial evaluation at the site through deployment of casualties at the receiving hospitals. The medical representative must resist the temptation to assist rescue personnel in individual emergency care activities, as his coordination role is vital to the success of the total rescue effort. The first responsibility of rescue personnel is to find those victims most in need of immediate life-saving care. Depending on the seriousness of the disaster, the care of most victims can be delayed without affecting their eventual good health. Many victims don't need immediate medical attention, but get it because they are conscious, apt to be ambulatory, and call attention to themselves, and because they're relatively easy to treat. 
Oh, I think my arm's broken. Let me see. It's burning. Okay, just hold still now. It's all right. That can be taken care of easily. Look, I'm going to I'm going to tag you, and someone else will be here to take care of you. All righty. While they're finding those victims who need immediate care, right, those with airway or breathing problems, or serious external bleeding, and this is the essence of immediate emergency care, rescue personnel are responsible for the initial triage and tagging of the victims. They also are responsible for moving the victims to the transportation assembly area in order of tag priority. One tagging method divides victims into four categories for transport, using a simple system that employs both color and symbols for quick, accurate identification. Red or immediate for victims, such as those with head, neck, chest, or abdominal injuries or severe burns, whose lives may be saved by expeditious surgery, immediate life-saving measures, or resuscitation with intravenous fluids or blood yellow or urgent for those with extensive skin wounds, obvious fractures or moderate burns. Green or delayed for victims with minor injuries such as cuts, bruises, small burns or possible fractures. Black indicates expectant, those so badly injured they are unlikely to survive no matter how much attention is given to them. Or dead, victims for removal to the morgue after the living triage victims have been transported. In some disasters, tags for victims contaminated by radioactivity may be needed. Ideally, rescue agencies such as police or fire will have prepared disaster packs containing many of the supply needs for triaging and field management of victims, including tags, intravenous solutions, drugs, blankets, and other equipment. At the transportation assembly area, decisions are made as to which victims are to be sent next to hospitals. A second triage should be performed by the medical coordinator or his appointed triage officer. In seconds, he must assess a victim's condition and perhaps change the initial triage classification. He alone must decide which victims are to be transported next and to which facilities. Hospitals then are informed of the victims being transported for their care. And the transportation officer begins the deployment of surface rescue vehicles and direction of air rescue vehicles, if available, to the transportation staging area for those victims who must be transported to distant hospitals. As victims begin arriving at the hospitals, the results of the hospitals having put their own disaster plans into effect become apparent. The Joint Commission on Accreditation of Hospitals requires a written external disaster plan that is rehearsed twice a year. The first responsibility here, upon arrival of the victims, is a third level triage under the direction of the hospital triage officer, usually an emergency physician. The hospital triage officer should not attempt to treat victims, except for airway stabilization, but should assess them and send them to the appropriate hospital area for treatment. The severely injured ideally should be sent to a central resuscitation area, often in the emergency department. Those requiring immediate surgery may go directly to the operating suite. A senior surgeon should help coordinate both these areas. Minor injuries may be treated in outpatient areas or even in areas in which patients normally are not seen. A disaster, whether caused by nature or by man, is any occurrence that threatens or causes loss of life and property and exceeds the routine capabilities of local governmental, health care, and community agencies. A good day-to-day -day emergency medical services operation is the foundation for effective disaster planning. Additional planning, training of rescue agency personnel, definition of responsibilities, and good communications can enable existing agencies to mobilize resources and save lives even in disaster situations. The unexpected can be anticipated, not specifically, but generally and plans developed for coping with it. Its components are clear. 
adequate manpower and equipment. A command post. Establishment of good communications. Presence of the triage concept throughout. Coordination of transportation. Coordination of hospital capabilities for treating victims. Such planning will help affect order that is essential to the preservation of life and the protection of property.